Um, so thank you very much. Um, so when we talk about elimination, um, obviously prevention is the most important, uh, but treatment is one uh, important strategy as well. So these are my disclosures. When we talk about which patient to treat, obviously the most important thing is to ask ourselves, well, what are the goals that we want to accomplish? Uh, we know that um, we need to suppress the virus, but the ultimate goal is really to prevent progression to cirrhosis, liver failure, liver cancer, and death, uh, improve um, symptoms, quality of life. For the patients, removing the stigma of infection is very important, um, and certainly uh, we want to decrease infectivity. I'm not going to get into details about what current treatment can do. You all know very well. Uh, we have um, treatment, uh, particularly with the news, they're very potent in suppressing virus supp uh, replication. And by doing so, we also reduce inflammation. And we now have data to show that we can also reverse fibrosis. We know that um, with long-term virus suppression, we can reduce progression to cirrhosis, liver failure, and we can decrease the incidence of liver cancer as well. And the current treatment is very safe, but there are limitations. These treatments suppress the virus, but do not eradicate the virus. We can't get rid of the CCC DNA or the integrated HBV DNA. The rate of S antigen loss is very low, except for patients infected with genotype A. And so for most patients, they require very long duration of treatment. And while the risk of um, liver cancer is reduced, it's not completely eliminated. And that's the reason why, unlike hepatitis C, we, where we now say treat everyone that um, you've diagnosed. With hepatitis B, we struggle with when to start treatment. For the patients who already got um, cirrhosis, it's actually pretty straightforward. And if you look at the different society guidelines, essentially, you know a patient has got cirrhosis, um, you put them on treatment, you don't need them to have high virus level or elevated liver enzymes. But majority of the patients that we see do not yet have um, cirrhosis. Um, and then we struggle with when do we start treatment. Um, the guidelines are actually quite similar, although the cutoffs are different. Uh, for antigen positive patients, um, the ASLD guidelines and the PASO guidelines are very similar. We use a cutoff level for HPV DNA of 20,000, um, and they need to have elevated liver enzymes unless there are other indications for inflammation or fibrosis. The ESO guidelines um, use a somewhat um, lower cutoff. For antigen negative patients, again, SLD guidelines and the positive guidelines are very similar. DNA cutoff of more than 2,000 with elevated liver enzyme in general more than two times. Now, note, however, the SLD um, defined upper limit of normal for ALT is 35 for men and 25 for women. Um, and you know that um, in diagnostic labs, sometimes um, the upper limit of normal can be 40, 50, 60. Um, so we actually use a somewhat lower cutoff. But also we indicate that, um, particularly for antigen positive patients, if they remain antigen positive um, when they're 45, 50, um, even if their liver enzymes are not elevated, we'll be recommending treatment. Um, and if they have family history of liver cancer, we'll be recommending treatment at an earlier stage. So this is essentially what we um, talk about when we look at um, patients who don't have um, cirrhosis. Um, the current recommendation would be uh, we treat the patients um, with active disease, but we're currently not recommending treatment uh, for the first phase, the immune tolerant patients and those in the inactive um, carrier state. So I've been criticized because I've been involved in um, developing these guidelines for many years um, that um, we don't recommend treating everyone and so you allow them to die. Um, you're a murderer. Uh, well, is it really that serious? Um, and one of the things that um, I want to make clear is when we sort of talk about treatment, not treatment, it's not so much, okay, I'm gonna treat this patient and I'm not gonna treat the other one. But rather the question is, the patient's in front of me in the clinic today, do I start a patient on treatment now? Or do I monitor the patient and start a treatment later on? Well, what do I mean by later on when it is indicated? Well, we know that with hepatitis B, people don't remain in a stable state. Um, and over time, the virus level may go up, the liver enzymes may go up. And so when the virus replication becomes more active, disease becomes more active, that's the time to think of um, starting treatment. Also, over the years, evidence-based guidelines have evolved as we understand the disease better, as the treatment is better. Now, we liberalize the treatment um, to some extent. And certainly, one day, uh, when curative treatment become available, 
uh, will be liberalizing um, treatment. So let's um, come back to talk about the immune tolerant phase patients. Um, a lot of them, people say, well, we should definitely be treating these patients because by definition, they have very high virus level. Um, and the review study done in Taiwan show very clearly that high HPV DNA is associated with increased risk of cirrhosis, liver cancer, and liver-related mortality. Um, other people would say that, well, with every disease, we always advocate for early treatment and not wait for the disease to become more advanced. And if you treat people earlier, before they have a more advanced fibrosis, um, they're going to have better outcome. And maybe you have less integrated um, DNA. Immunologists um, would argue with us that you call the immune tolerant, but you have absolutely no data to show that they're tolerant. And in fact, some of the recent studies suggest that these people do mount some immune response to hepatitis B. Maybe it's not so different from patients in the immune active phase. So let's examine some of these um, data. Well, I don't really need to go through this um, slide. You know that very well. The review studies show that um, higher HPV DNA associated with um, higher chance of liver cancer um, cirrhosis and liver mortality. Data from Professor Leo's group that um, if patients remain Yenogen positive for a long time, beyond the age of 40, um, even if they subsequently um, seroconvert um, from Yenogen positive to Yenogen negative, um, there's a higher chance that they go to the E-negative chronic phase, hepatitis B phase, instead of inactive carry phase, they have a higher chance of cirrhosis as well as liver cancer. So you really want to control the virus much sooner. Um, again, this is some data from Taiwan that um, show that um, if um, you follow patients with Yenogen positive for a long period of time, um, you see that um, depending on when they seroconvert, if they seroconvert very early on before the age of 30, uh, versus between 30 to 40, versus um, above the age of 40, um, the chance of having bad outcome uh, is higher um, if it takes longer for them to use zero convert. So these are all evidence um, that um, proponents for treating patients' immune tolerant phase put forward. This is also data from a Korean study that said, it, um, look, if you have immune tolerant patients and you don't treat them, uh, which is the red line, um, they actually do worse than the patients with um, immune active um, disease uh, and you treat them. But look very carefully because the um, mean age of the immune tolerant patient was 38 and the immune active patient was 40, which is very unusual because immune tolerance should embrace a much wider age range. So obviously if you pick the older immune tolerant patients, their outcome would not be as good. Well, these are what the immunologists um, show us. Um, they said it, um, look, you said it, they're immune tolerant. They really are not. Because if you look at the number of um, B, um, um, uh, hepatitis B ep epitopes that the T cells can mount an immune response to, um, they're no different whether they're immune tolerant or immune active. So they seem to have um, similar immune response. But I would say that, no, I still don't think that we should be treating them now with the drugs that we have. Now, 10 years from now, we have better drugs, my answer may be different. Well, why not? Uh, if the treatment is to prevent HPV DNA integration, we know that integration actually occurs very early, even in acute hepatitis B. So the fact that you're treating them five years early does not mean that you can't eliminate integration. Um, there are limited studies in which um, these patients have been biopsy, they have um, very little inflammation and fibrosis. And if you follow them, over time, the first five, 10 years, very few of them would have a um, bad outcome. Um, and Professor Leo and his group actually have shown us, and all of us know that if you watch them for long enough, some of them do undergo spontaneous e zero conversion, and they may go into durable remission. But more importantly, it is because the currently available treatment doesn't work very well for these patients. There are exceptions, however, um, if um, patients remain in um, the yenogen, um, in the immune tolerant phase, yenogen positive, very high DNA, um, when they're already 45, 50, that's a very different story. We'll be um, treating them. If they're currently pregnant, we'll put them on treatment in the third trimester of pregnancy to reduce mother-to-child transmission. And certainly, if they require immunosuppressive therapy, we'll give them prophylactic antiviral to prevent reactivation. So this basically shows spontaneous seroconversion. If you look at um, people, um, Yenogen positive for very young patients, 80, 90% of them are Yenogen positive. But over time, 
you see that um, as they get older, um, the prevalence of Yanagen decrease. This is because um, spontaneous E0 conversion can occur. So unlike hepatitis C, where in chronic infection, um, the virus seldom goes away with hepatitis B, people can go into um, spontaneous E0 conversion. And this is some data from uh, Professor Drew and Professor Lau, um, showing that in immune tolerant patients, and here the mean age of the patients was around 28 at the time of enrollment, the first 10 years of follow up, very little clinical outcome. Now sure, if you watch them, don't do anything for the next 40 years. Someone is gonna die from cirrhosis, liver failure, liver cancer. But we're not saying that you don't do anything for the next 40 years. We say that you monitor them and you might be treating them at a later time. And again, I want to come back to this slide because um, yes, if you wait too long, bad things are going to happen. But if you actually intervene sooner, um, then you're okay. Because the first 20, 30 years, um, those patients who remain antigen positive have very low risk of clinical outcome. Now, coming back to immunological studies, this is some data from the Hepatitis B Research Network um, that's funded by the um, NIH. Um, everyone said, that, um, well, you know, you show immunological response in the immune tolerant group, immune active group, and in active carriers. Um, and when you look at a T cell response, there's no statistically significant difference. But Statistical significance and clinical significance are different. If you look at the height of the bars, you can see that the immune tolerant group has a lower bar. The immune response is actually not as good. It's just that uh, we had fewer patients in the immune tolerant group, 21 patients compared to 50, 60 in these other groups. And ha we have a um, similar um, number. Uh, these might actually reach statistical significance. So I do think that their response is not quite the same. But as I've mentioned, it's really one of the reasons why we say not liberalize the treatment is because current treatment doesn't work very well. And these are really old data from um, interferon um, era, where if you, the, regardless of the HBB genotype, if you look at patients with um, minimally elevated liver enzymes versus those with elevated liver enzymes, the chance of a response, and here uh, it means um, antigen seroconversion, is much lower than those with elevated liver enzymes. So it doesn't work as well. You put the patients through horrible treatment and they have a very low chance of response. This is also true with um, the oral antivirals. This is some data from Antecavir, and we're not talking about normal liver enzymes. We're actually talking about mild liver enzyme increase, Compared to those with um, ALT more than two times, much lower chance of user conversion, DNA suppression, and normalization of ALT. Now, these are retrospective um, post hoc analysis. But there's a study which is prospective, um, which purposely enrolled patients in the immune tolerant phase and randomized the patients to either TDF monotherapy or combination of TDF and FTC. And what you see is that after four years of continuous treatment, not every patient has suppressed HBV DNA, almost no yeast cell conversion, no s antigen loss, and when treatment is stopped after four years, everyone relapsed. So it's not that we don't want to help these patients, but with the currently available treatment, we aren't able to achieve much. So this is more recent from the Hepatitis B Research Network, uh, where we had two parallel studies, one in children and one in adults. What we did was um, we um, pre-treat the patients with antacavir for eight weeks, and then we continue, uh, but we add um, PAC interferon at week eight and go on until week 48. Then we stop the treatment and we watch um, these patients. And what do we get? Well, very um, disappointing, because in the children, um, two out of um, 60 of them um, did achieve the primary endpoint of antigen loss and suppress um, DNA, but in the adults, no one. And in fact, what happened is, um, this one patient who appeared to have a response at the end of treatment actually became antigen negative chronic hepatitis uh, with elevated ALT and elevated liver enzymes. What was actually interesting to know is that when the treatment was stopped, um, these patients, most of them remained antigen positive, and the DNA shot back up very quickly, within weeks. But the reason why I still believe that these are immune tolerant patients was they don't have ALT flare. The ALT stay flat um, even though the DNA went from two lock to eight lock within a few weeks. Um, so the immune response to hepatitis B is different in these patients. So I hope I've convinced you that 
at the current time, with the treatment that we have available, um, it is not appropriate to liberalize treatment for immune tolerant patients, except for those who are perhaps older uh, with evidence of um, fibrosis. But what about the inactive carriers? And I would say that, um, yeah, we're not going to treat them if we're pretty sure that they're in the inactive carry phase. Now, the challenge, of course, is some of these patients, you're not sure whether they're in the inactive carry phase or whether they have energy negative chronic hepatitis and they're just going up and down. You happen to catch them when um, the disease is more quiescent. The reason why we're not treating them is because the majority of them have minimal inflammation and fibrosis. And again, over a long period of follow-up, um, the risk of having clinical outcome is low, and we don't know if um, suppressing low-level virus is going to bring about clinical benefit. Again, each study, you can interpret the results very differently. Um, so this is some data from the re review study that people have used to show um, why we should be treating inactive carriers, because they said, that, look, the inactive carriers have statistically significantly higher risk of developing liver cancer than people who don't have hepatitis B. Of course, we can see that the two lines are very different. But look very carefully at the y-axis, OK? Um, this is 0 0.005, which means the 0.5% chance of liver cancer after 13 years. And in fact, um, this is actually less than 1% after 13 years. So if you don't look at the y-axis, um, you say that the two lines are very dramatic. So yeah, I mean, some of these patients are going to have bad outcomes. But the risk of a bad outcome is actually not dramatically high. Um, and um, the key is really trying to figure out whether they're truly um, inactive. Uh, and this is some nice data from um, you guys um, from Taiwan, um, showing that among the patients who are antigen negative with low DNA, if you're able to quantify surface antigen, it can further help you identify the patients who are truly inactive um, and um, who would have a um, better outcome. And therefore, you don't need to rush and put them on um, treatment. But there are also data to um, suggest that, well, if you were to put um, patients on treatment, do we always benefit them? And this is actually interesting um, data from a Taiwan study, um, from a Korean study, uh, where they actually took patients uh, with um, Yi negative from um, chronic hepatitis B, um, and they um, put them on antiviral therapy and compare the outcome with patients who are inactive from um, carriers. And what they show is that um, in patients with active disease, even when you suppress the virus, their outcome is actually not as good as patients who are naturally inactive carriers. And we actually wrote an editorial in GUT um, saying that if your own immune response gets you to the final destination, it is much better than um, artificially suppressing uh, with antiviral treatment. Um, so again, this sort of um, backs the question that whether artificially suppressing the virus with antiviral therapy in inactive carriers would benefit the patients at all. Um, I've mentioned that um, some people argue that when we make the guidelines too strict, we're actually hurting the patient. So this is actually data from Myron Tong from a long while ago when he did a retrospective analysis of his clinic patient and he said, um, well, I uh, follow these patients um, who, did not, um, um, who were not treated and um, lo and behold, some of them did develop cancer and some of them died. And when I analyze how many of them would meet some criteria for starting treatment, majority of them do not meet criteria. And if I have followed your recommendations and then treat these patients, that's what happened to those patients. But again, it is extremely important for us to remember that the guidelines only serve as a guidance. And the guidelines do recommend that you individualize treatment decisions um, based on individual patient and disease characteristics. And when a patient doesn't meet criteria for starting treatment today, we are not recommending that you send a patient away never to see them again. We recommend that you continue to monitor these patients. Um, and when the disease becomes more active later on, you're going to start them on treatment. Um, some people would argue, what's the downside of liberalizing treatment? Because the treatment is convenient, the treatment is safe. Well, there are issues because they're not 100% safe. I mean, there are um, very minor side effects. Um, but there's also cost. And there's also issue with um, adherence. Um, because when you put these patients on long-term treatment, you think that the patients are on treatment. But many of them, after a while, decide to stop the treatment on their own. Um, so for all these reasons, I think that um, the current guidelines are reasonable. Um, reasonable for today. Um, 
as we have better treatment and our knowledge evolve, uh, we'll be updating those guidelines. And certainly, um, when the patient's condition change, we'll also be revising our recommendation for that patient as well. Thank you.